Amen. Well, I'm glad to be here tonight. Glad to be under the tabernacle. And I've been waiting all week to hear the Burns Trio sing. I sure enjoyed that. That was a blessing, all the singing. And I want to thank you, Brother Joe, for inviting me to come. And uh, thank you for all you've done for me in the nice hotel room and all the food and the fellowship. And then thank you for being here. What a wonderful crowd on a Friday night. Amen. Appreciate you coming. Hadn't the Lord been good to us this week and helped us? I used to pastor a little church. We had a fellow in the church. His name was Danny Doctor. He was 21 years old uh, when I started pastoring there. He was a Down Syndrome boy. And uh, he was saved and loved God and loved to preach. And uh, sometime I'd, we'd have a little tag team preaching on Sunday night. He'd preach for 10 minutes and I'd preach for 20. But every time I'd say the Lord is good, he'd shout out all the time. And that's the truth. Amen. He's good to us all the time. And I thank him for what he's done. Thank you for allowing me to be a part of this meeting this week. I have a simple thought on my mind I want us to consider tonight from the book of Jonah in chapter number 3. If you'll turn over there with me to the book of Jonah in chapter number 3. And we'll read a little bit here in this passage. I'm taking for granted that you are somewhat familiar with the book of Jonah tonight and what takes place. But I will remind you that Jonah was a prophet of God. God told him to go to Nineveh. Jonah rose up to flee from the presence of the Lord. And God hunted him down, tracked him down, sent a great storm. It's amazing how many times in the Bible God speaks to people out of the storm. Next time you get in a storm, you need to listen for him. He's trying to tell you something. And uh, he hunts him down and prepares a great fish to swallow up Jonah in the belly of that fish. God deals with Jonah's heart and uh, Jonah repents and decides uh, uh, that he's going to pay his vows and do what God says and the fish vomits him up on dry land. And that's where we come to Jonah chapter 3. And the Bible said, And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go unto Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. So Jonah arose and went unto Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days' journey. And Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey, and he cried and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them even to the least of them. For word came unto the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, and he laid his robe from him and covered him with sackcloth and sat in ashes. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste any anything, let them not feed nor drink water. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. Yea, let them turn everyone from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. Who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not? And God saw their works that they turned from their evil way, and God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them, and he did it not. Let's pray a moment. Our Father, tonight we love you because you first loved us. We are thankful, Lord, to be here tonight. We come to your presence, Lord, humbling ourselves before you and thanking you for the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ that gives us access to come with boldness before the throne of grace. Now, I pray you'll help us now tonight, Lord. I thank you for the singing. I thank you for all that you've done for us already in these two weeks. But, Lord, I would ask you tonight, I'm needy in my heart, Lord. I need you to speak to me and help me tonight. I need you, Lord, to speak to these people. Lord, as I preach to men's ears, I pray that you'll speak to men's hearts. I pray the Holy Ghost would help us tonight to exalt the Lord Jesus and exhort the saints to build up the church, 
Lord, and build up the people of God. Lord, may there be an increase in our faith tonight. May we look to you, Lord, for the needs that are in our lives. As we leave this, uh, as we leave this tabernacle tonight, Lord, in a few moments when the preaching and the singing is over, may we leave, Lord, with our hearts set upon Thee, uh, with hearts of faith, looking to what You can do through us, uh, that You might save a world that's dying and lost and on their way to hell. Help us now, Lord. We need You tonight, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I, I love the book of Jonah. I love to study this book. Some people think that the book of Jonah is about a great fish, but really the book of Jonah is about a great father. Some people think that the book of Jonah is a book of judgment, but really the book of Jonah is a book of mercy. It's a story of love. It begins with love and it ends with love. It was the love of God. When we read in chapter 1, the Word of the Lord came unto Jonah. I'm going to tell you, it's the love of God every time the Word of God comes to somebody like like us. And then it was the love of God for Nineveh when God said to go down there and cry against that great city. I used to say that Jonah's message in chapter 3 when he said, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. I used to think there was no mercy in that message. But there is mercy. There's 40 days of mercy in that message. If God wasn't interested in giving them mercy, He'd have just brought judgment and put an end to them. But He warned them beforehand and gave them 40 days to get right with God. It begins with love. It also ends with love. Jonah's sitting in the end under that uh, uh, booth there that he's made and the gourd has died and he's angry and God says to him, Thou hast had pity on the gourd for the which thou hast not labored, neither madest it grow, which came up in a night and perished in a night. Should not I spare Nineveh, that great city wherein are more than six score thousand persons that cannot discern between their right hand and their left and also much cattle. I think perhaps this may be the book of Jonah, one of the greatest displays in the Old Testament of the mercy and the love of God for those that don't love Him. I, we could spend a little time looking at what goes on in each chapter, but I'm going to tell you tonight, I'm really just interested in one little phrase that I find in the third chapter of the book of Jonah. Jonah has come and he's preached this message, yet forty days in Nineveh shall be overthrown. He's preached it in the streets up in the city. He's gone a day's journey in and preached about the judgment of God. And that word, the Bible said, has come up to the king. And the king calls for his nobles, and they sit down together. And the Bible tells us what he goes through, but he's looking at those fellows, and he said, here's what we're going to do. We're going to proclaim a fast. We're going to proclaim a fast for the people and even for the livestock. We're going to put on sackcloth and ashes. He said, the Bible said, he sat down down in the ashes. And then he said this, and this is what I'm interested in. He said, who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from His fierce anger that we perish not. I'm telling you, brethren, I was reading through that third chapter. I got to that little phrase, who can tell? And I got to thinking about God. I got to thinking about His love. I got to thinking about His mercy. I got to thinking about His power. And I want to preach a little while tonight on who can tell what God will do? Who can tell tonight what God is able to do. I thought about some verses. I wrote them down. Uh, the Bible said, Jesus said this, With men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. In Jeremiah, God said, Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? I want to ask you tonight. You say, Preacher, I've got a need in my life. I just don't know how I can get victory. I just don't know how I can get over this. I just don't know how I can get through this. I'd like to say to you tonight, who can tell what God is able to do in your life? I was thinking tonight, and I'm going to preach in a minute. I've got to warm up a little while. I was thinking tonight about some of the things that I have seen God do in my lifetime and some of the things that I've read about in the Bible that God has done in people's lives. I was thinking about in the Bible a man named Jacob. You know what Jacob was? He was a liar. He was a deceiver. His name, Jacob, means the heel catcher. He came out of the womb holding on to his brother's heel. And that was the bent of his life. It seemed like he spent the rest of his life a conniving. He had a scheme, reaching. Always had a plan. But I'm going to tell you in Genesis chapter 32, uh, Jacob had a wrestling match with God. God wrestled.
wrestled with him, and Jacob lost and God won. But the truth of the matter was, God, uh, Jacob won also when he lost to God. Now, I thought about Jacob. Here is a man who's a deceiver. But it's an amazing thing what God can do with a man who's a liar when he gets a hold of him. Go over to the New Testament and find out where Paul begins to talk about the oracles of God. He's speaking about the Jews, and he says, What advantage hath the Jew? And then he makes this statement. He said, Through him, through them came the oracles of God. You know what the oracles of God are? That's the Word of God. You know the only truth we have in this world today is found right here in these pages. That blessed Word of God. I want to ask you where it came from. I'll tell you where it came from. God used the man that used to be the notorious liar and worked in his life. And out of his descendants, out of the descendants of the liar, came the only truth that we have in the world. Who can tell what God can do with an old sinner? Who can tell what God can do with a life? I thought about a little girl in the Bible over there in the book of uh, uh, Joshua by the name of Rahab. And the Bible said she was a harlot. You know what a harlot is. Somebody tried to say, well, she's an innkeeper. No, she wasn't an innkeeper. She was a harlot. And I'm going to tell you, friend, she lived a wicked life. And no doubt as a harlot had uh, suffered at the hands of men and lived an immoral life. But something happened in her life. She heard about God. And the Bible said when those two spies came into Jericho, she met them and she said, I know that your God is a God in heaven and a God, the God in earth. And it's an interesting thing. She hid them on the roof among the flax. And the Bible said in Proverbs 31, that's what the virtuous woman does. She works with the flax. Something had happened in that little girl's life. What was it? It was God that moved in. I'm going to tell you something, friend. Here is a woman who was a harlot, had a wicked past. But if I've studied my Bible outright, uh, she married a man named Salmon, a man in Israel. And they had a son named Boaz. And one day Boaz was out in the field uh, and a little old girl by the name of Ruth uh, who was in a strange country and had no father and had no husband to look out after her. She walked out into that field uh, and Boaz came a-walking up and he said to her, Have not I charged the young men not to touch thee? I, when I read that I thought, Here is the son of the harlot. But God got a hold of her life uh, and she raised up a boy who knew how to protect a woman uh, and treat her the way she ought to be treated. Who can and tell what God can do. I thought about a woman in the Bible by the name of Bathsheba. She was an adulteress. Did you hear me? The Bible said she was an adulteress. She committed adultery with David. But God forgave that sin. And God must have worked in her life. Because over in Proverbs chapter 31, there's a fellow that wrote a little thing about how to find a good woman. How to find the right kind of woman. He talks to us about a virtuous woman. You know how he starts it? He said, these are the words of Lemuel which his mother taught him. You know what Lemuel is? That's Bathsheba's a pet name for her son Solomon. Here is a woman who was an adulteress. She was, in fact, the strange woman in the past. But God must have got a hold of her life and turned that thing around and she teaches her boy what to look for in a wife. I'm saying to you, who can tell? Who can tell? Who can tell what God can do? I thought of some of the things I've seen in my own life. I remember preaching. A fellow came up to me the other night and mentioned about years ago when I used to go preach at Shining Light Baptist Church in the youth camp. I'm telling you, we had some meetings down there. And I remember the very first year that I was ever there, I went to the Shining Light Baptist Church and I got up on a Sunday morning. We had a service and we had three people saved. We had a good service. But Sunday night I got up. I had a message. I felt like God wanted me to preach. And I got up in the pulpit and I opened my Bible. I read the first three words of the text. Just three words. And before I could get out the fourth word, this woman jumped up in the seat out there in the pew and she hollered. She said, Stop! Stop! And I looked at her. She said, I'm supposed to be a counselor this week. I'm supposed to counsel with young people. And she said, I'm not saved. I'm not even saved. I'm not even really saved. i got to get saved and i got to do it right now. And here she came and bowed down at the altar. Well, I'm going to tell you, I wasn't used to that. How they're supposed to get saved when the service is over with. You know, I didn't know exactly what to do. So I said, well, I'll try it again. So I read those same three words. And when I got to try to get that fourth word out, a man jumped
jumped up in the service and said, wait, wait, I'm not right with God. I've been visiting this church and God told me to join and I'm supposed to join and I've got to get it right with God. And here he came. I said, okay, one more time. I read those same three verses again. And when I tried to get to that or the same three words, I tried to get to that fourth verse and another man jumped up and said, stop. I'm not saved either. I, you know, I'm slow, but I catch on after a while. I closed my Bible and sat down at 12 people got born again in the service. What are you saying? I'm saying, who can tell what God can do? Who can tell tonight? Now, I'm looking in this passage. Now, I want us to look at the book of Jonah tonight, and I want to reinforce this point tonight. Who can tell? Who can tell? And I believe the reason God wants me to preach this tonight is because there's somebody here, maybe a lot of somebody's, who's facing something in your life, and you're looking at it and you're saying, there's no way to get by this, there's no way to get over this. There may be some precious mom and dad tonight who've got a wayward son or a wayward daughter, and you're saying they're too hard, they've gone too far. There may be somebody you know tonight that's lost without God, and you say they're too hard for God. There may be somebody tonight you messed up. I mean, you got out of the will of God, and you messed things up. And the devil and everybody else been telling you that it's over and you can't serve God and you're done with. Well, my answer to you is, who can tell what God is able to do? Who can tell? Uh, by the way, can I just say this to you? There's a whole lot of people who'd like to tell God what He can do and what He can't do. There's a whole lot of people who would like to decide for everybody else whether God can use them or not. My answer is, who can tell who has directed the Spirit of the Lord or be in His counsel have taught Him. He don't need my advice. Hallelujah. I believe I'll just say, who can tell what God can do? I just have three little points tonight. When I look at the book of Jonah, I say, number one, who can tell what God can do with a backslidden saint? Who can tell? Now, I'm not encouraging you to sin. I'm not saying it's all right to sin. I'm not saying to you that it's not a serious and a dangerous thing for a child of God to get out of the will of God. I'm not saying to you that there's no chastisement. I'm not saying to you that there won't be consequences of your sin. But I am saying to you, there is a wonderful, loving God of mercy. And if you'll repent of your sin and come back and get your heart right with God, who can tell what God can do with a backslidden saint? Now, here's Jonah. Here's Jonah. We read about one other prophecy that Jonah has made. It was a pro popular prophecy. He prophesied that Israel would enlarge their coasts. I reckon that made him popular among the people. Now God has come to him. I don't know how many prophecies he has uttered, but we'll only find two in the Bible. That first one, that Israel will enlarge their coast. And now God comes to Jonah and he said, Now I got another prophecy for you. I got a sermon I want you to preach. But it's not in Israel. It's over there in Nineveh. You know what the Ninevites were known for? Their cruelty. That's why in this passage we read when they repented, that the king said, Let everyone turn from the violence that is in their hands. You know what they were known for? They were known for taking their enemies and filleting them, skinning them alive and leaving them in the sun to dry. That's what they're known for. When Nahum will speak about them later on, he will say, Woe unto the bloody city. They were a city that let blood. They were a city that was known for being wicked and vicious of people that were filled with violence. And here is a man from Gath Hefer by the name of Jonah. His name means dove. He's a man of peace, but God comes and says to him, I want you to go down to Nineveh, that place of war, that place of violence, and I want you to go down there and cry against them. I don't know exactly why Jonah did not want to go. I do know this. In Jonah chapter 2 and verse 8, he said, They that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy. So I do know at least the reason Jonah ran was because he believed some sort of lie. I have a little inkling what kind of lie it was, but I'm not preaching on that tonight. But he did run from God. The Bible said he rose up to flee up from the presence of the Lord. He got up and left and took off a running, going the opposite way. If you've ever 
ever looked on a map as to where Jonah was and where Tarshish was. He was going as far as he could get from the hand of God. He had this idea he could run away from God. He is a backslidden saint. He is a backslidden preacher. Now, I'm going to tell you something, brethren, brethren, and I don't mean to start any fights, but I know some folks who would have said, sorry, Jonah, you'll never be able to preach again. Sorry, Jonah, you'll never be able to be used again. You went the wrong direction. You didn't go the way God said to go. I'm sorry, son, you'll never be able to preach again. But I'm going to tell you, when Jonah got his heart right, the Bible said the word of the Lord came unto Jonah. Hallelujah. The second time, uh, you might have disqualified him. Hallelujah. But God didn't disqualify him. You might have said, I won't listen to him. But God said, I'm still going to use him. That man... And so he said to Jonah, I go into Nineveh and preach to that city. Go preach to that city. And Jonah ran. And he went and he got in that city. It's a large city of three days' journey. He got in a day and began to preach. And hallelujah, when he began to preach, God began to work. And look what happened. It was one of the greatest revivals that were read about in the, in the Word of God. A whole city from the greatest to the least of them repented. How'd he do it? He did it with a fellow who'd been backslid. He did it with a fellow who'd ran from God. I'm saying to you tonight, you say, preacher, I'm away from God. Then my word is to you, why don't you come home? Why don't you get up from where you are and come back to God and see if God won't say, I forgive you. Who can tell? I love to read about that prodigal son. Did you ever think about how badly he treated his father? He said, give me the portion of goods that falleth unto me. And he divided unto them as them is living. And not long after, he took his goods and went into a far country. Now, here's really what he said. He said, Daddy, I would rather have what you have than to have you. I want your possessions, but I don't want your fellowship. Just give me what you have, and I'm going my own way and do my own thing. You know, when my, I had a fellow in my home one time and had some guns in a gun cabinet, a shotgun, a couple of rifles. He looked at him. He said, my, those are nice. I said, those are an inheritance from my daddy. He said, I bet you're glad to have them. I said, well, I'm glad I have them, but I'd rather have daddy. But this boy said, I'd rather have the inheritance. And I don't want nothing to do with daddy. And off he went. He's pretty sorry, isn't he? He's as sorry as you and I are when we turn from God and run from God and we take advantage of the gifts of God and forget about the one that gave them to us and we live our own life and we get in a far country and there's that boy. He's out in that far country and he gets down to nothing. He's in the hog pen. He's down there. And the Bible said he fain would fill his belly with the husk that the swine did eat and no man gave unto him. And I like this little phrase. The Bible said he came unto himself. He came to himself. What does that mean? Did you ever go in the Walmart and you met somebody you knew and you went home and said, guess who I came upon in the Walmart? And what you're saying was, I recognize somebody. You know what he did? He got down there in that hog pen and he came to himself. He recognized himself. He saw what he was and where he was. And when he did, he said, How many of my hired servants, uh, how many hired servants in my father's house have bread enough and despair? And I perish with hunger. And then he said, I will arise and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before thee and am no more worthy to be called thy son. I like what he said. You know what I like about it? It sounds to me like he's rehearsing. Not that he doesn't mean it, he means it, but he wants to say it just right. It sounds like to me uh, that he heads up out of that hog pen uh, with it written down saying, Here's what I'm going to say to my daddy. That Father, I've sinned against heaven and before thee. I'm no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy higher servants. He's a practicing. You know why? Because he thinks he's going to have to talk his daddy into letting him come back. He thinks he's going to have to convince him to let him come back on the property. But you know what happened just as well as I do. When he was yet a long way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. I like that word kiss. It's a word. It doesn't mean this. It means this. 
It's like that ant that used to grab you and say, I'm going to kiss your whole face. He falls down on him and begins to, I can see him pushing his daddy. Say, Daddy, Daddy, i got to tell you where I've been. Daddy, no, Daddy didn't care where he'd been. Daddy was glad he was home. Daddy was glad he was back. I'm saying to who can tell what God would do tonight if you just come home. You say, Preacher, you don't know how far away I got. Well, how far away was the far country? How far away was Tarshish? Long way. How far away was Moab? Long way. You say, Preacher, you don't know what I've done. No, I don't. But I reckon that boy had to smell that hog pen on him. But when he came home, Daddy never said one word about it. Daddy never said one word about that hog pen. Daddy said, bring forth the best robe and put on him. Put a ring on his finger, shoes on his feet. Kill the fatted calf. You say, preacher, I just don't know. I don't know either, but who can tell? Who can tell? If you just did, I'm come to him tonight. If you just tell him the truth about what you are and where you've been, who can tell what this loving and kind and merciful God would do if you just come home? I was preaching out in Pennsylvania, a place called Camp Glory. And one afternoon we had all the preachers and singers get in and everybody else had gone home. We had a little service with just us. And we testified to one another and sang together and had a time of prayer requests. One dear family stood up, the mother and the father, and said, I wish you'd pray for Sonny. I knew who Sonny was. That was their oldest boy. And here's what they said. They said, we haven't heard from him in four years. We don't know if he's alive or dead. Their hearts were broken. They were weeping and crying. They said, wish you'd pray for Sonny. So we did. We got on our knees and we called on God and called Sonny's name. Asked God to work in his heart. As in July. September, I was preaching at the Liberty Baptist Church in Traverse City, Michigan. I stand at the back before the service, and a preacher that I knew walked in. I shook his hand, and there's a fellow behind him. And when that fellow walked in, I shook his hand. I said, I'm Brian McBride. I'm doing the preaching tonight. I'm so glad you're here. And he shook my hand, and he told me his name, and it was Sonny. And I looked at him. I, I looked at him. I was shocked. I looked at him, he, and he looked at me, and he said, yep. He said, I'm who you think I am. He said, I'm the black sheep of my family. That night, God helped us. When the invitation time came, here He come. Got down on the altar. I got down beside Him on the altar and said, Sonny, what would you come for? He said, I want to get right with God. He said, I've been out. I want God to forgive me. I want to come home. And down there on the altar, He prayed and poured His heart out to God. And God, He got Himself back in right with God. And God had mercy on Him. But here's the part I like. He came home. You say, Preacher, what can God do? Well, He came home. And when we got done praying, I said, Now, Sonny, you need to call your dad. You need to let him know you got right with God. He said, No, they don't want to hear from me. I'm an embarrassment to them. I've destroyed their testimony. I'm an embarrassment. He don't want to hear from me. I said, Yes, He does. I was with them. We prayed. They wept over you. He said, I'm a Ashamed. I'm ashamed to call him. I can't call him. And so after the service, we went over to the preacher's house. And my mother-in-law, she was here last night and sung. Some of you heard her. She got to preaching to him. You ain't never been preached to till you got preached to by a mother-in-law. She'd give you a look, freeze your socks to your ankles. Amen. And she got to preaching to him. She said, now you call your mother. You tell her you got right with God. He said, I can't call her. I can't call her. I'm so ashamed. I know I've ruined their testimony. And she said, you call your mother. Well, they didn't call that night. But about a week later, it got on the phone and called called him and told him he got right with God. Here's what they did. Uh, they sent him a plane ticket and flew him out to where they were. They met him at the airport. When they got off the plane, when he got off the plane, they took him down to the mall. They bought him a brand new suit. They took him to the shoe store and bought him brand new shoes and put on his feet. They took him to the jeweler and bought a ring and put it on his finger and took him down to the steakhouse and killed the fatted calf. You know what they're saying? They're saying, we're glad you're back. We're glad you're home. Can I say to you, friend, you say, Hey, preacher, what will happen? I don't know what will happen if you come, but who can tell? Who can tell? Who can tell? Just come on. Just come on home. Hey, now listen to me. Mom, Mama, 
Mama, Daddy, that youngin's running. That youngin's out of the will of God. That youngin's not where you want him to be. And the old devil said to you, they ain't never coming back. They ain't never getting right. I'd like to say to you, well, who can tell? When you're dealing with a God whose mercy is everlasting and His goodness endureth forever, who can tell? Why don't you just keep praying? Why don't you just keep calling on God? Why don't you just keep loving Him? Who can tell what God could do? A dear friend of mine was preaching... And he's preaching on that passage where Jesus said, This kind cometh not forth, but by prayer and fasting. And when he left the service, he finished out the meeting and went home. And the next year he went back. A white-haired lady met him at the door. She said, Preacher, you probably don't remember me, but I remember you. She said, Do you remember last year you preached on this kind cometh not forth, but by prayer and fasting? He said, I remember she said, after you left, something happened to our daughter. She said she went crazy. She started to live. She'd been saved, had a profession of faith. But she started to live a wicked life, and she ran away. We didn't know where she was. But she said, I remembered. This kind cometh not forth, but by prayer and fasting. And she said, I began to pray, and I began to fast. She said, I would pray and fast on a regular basis. She said, two or three months went by. We didn't know where she was or what she, what she was doing. She said, we got a letter in the mail. No return address, just a letter. She said, we opened it up and began to read, and it was from our daughter. She said, dear mom and dad, went something like this. I won't quote it verbatim. She said, dear mom and dad, I know I've shamed the family. I know I've done wrong, and God has chastened me. She said, I wanted you to know I'm right with God. She said, I know I can't come home. I know that I've, I've ruined our testimony and I can't come home. She said, but I wanted you to know I've repented of my sin. I'm right with God. I'm living in a little apartment and I'm going to a good church. And I wanted you to know I'm living for God. And I wanted you to know I love you and I'm sorry. And she ended the letter. There was no return address, but there was a postmark. And they used that postmark to track down where that letter came from and found that little old girl in that apartment and packed her up and took her in their arms and carried her own home. You said, what he you say? Here's what I'm saying. You say, preacher, I've gone too far. I'm too backslid on God. Well, my answer to you is, who can tell? When you're dealing with a God like the God I know and the God I serve, I can only say to you, there just ain't no telling what His love will do and what His mercy will do. There ain't no telling. There's no exhausting His grace. I'm saying, friend, who can tell? Why don't you just come on home? I got to reading about that mercy being everlasting. It's the Hebrew word olam. Olam means time out of mind. The vanishing point. I was preaching in West Virginia and they took me up and I got an illustration of what olam means. They took me to see the New River Bridge in West Virginia. I was standing up on that, uh, on that scenic overlook looking at that wonderful bridge and then I saw underneath it the New River Gorge and then down in the bottom, nobody told me this, but I'm smart like this, I saw what I figured was the New River. Figured that out. And I looked down there and I'm up on that overlook and I followed that river as it wound its way through that gorge. And it came to a certain spot and it got all misty. Might have been clouds. I was way up yonder there. And it disappeared. That river vanished. Now, I could have thought that's the end. But I knew if I went down in that gorge and followed that river, river as it wound around in that gorge, when I came to that place where it looked like it vanished, guess what? It would have kept on going. And there'd have been another vanishing point. 
And if I'd have followed that river around and followed that, I'd have come to another vanishing point. And when I got there, I'd have found out it still kept going. That's exactly what God means when He said that His mercy is everlasting. It's out of mind. It's beyond the vanishing point. You look down there and you say, well, if it ever gets that bad, we're all done. No, if you ever get there, you'll find out that His mercy is still fresh and His grace is still available and His love is still real and His Word is still true and His invitations are still good. Here's what I'm saying to you. I'm not saying there's no consequence for sin. You know better than that. I'm not saying there's no chastening hand. But I am saying if you see you're away from God and the devil says you can't come back, why don't you just turn and go back to God? Because who can tell what He will do? Who could tell? And mom and daddy, who can tell what he'll do if you'll keep praying? If you'll fast, if you'll call on God, there ain't no telling what he can do in the life of that young. And you say, I can't reach him. I know it. But I know his word is like a hammer that breaketh the rock in pieces. And I know prayer will reach where you cannot reach and where you cannot go. He says, he's too far. He's done too much. I like when Paul said, and such were some of you. He said, you're not what you were. You're not what you used to be. I'm telling you, who can tell what God can do with a backslidden saint? You know what tickles me about old Jonah? One day Jesus was preaching. And those old hardened Jews said, give us a sign. Jesus said, a wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. He said to them, they shall no sign be given thee save the sign of the prophet Jonas. And then he began to tell about those three days. You know what he was saying? Listen to me now. You know what he's saying? He's saying, you know what Jonah turned out to be? He turned out to be a type of myself. He turned out to be a mirror of myself, a forerunner. Now, I want you to think what he did with the backslidden prophet. He took the backslidden prophet, got him back in the will of God, and made him a type of himself, a reflection of the Lord Jesus. I'm going to tell you, isn't that what life is all about? That you and I would be a reflection of the Lord Jesus Christ? When they would see us, they would think of Him. Well, who did He do that with? He didn't do it with the prophet that never ran. He did it with the prophet that did run. You might have counted Him out, but who? Who can tell what God can do with a backslidden saint who will come home? Who can tell? Who can tell? Better be careful who you count out. I'm glad God. I'm glad God didn't count Jonah out. <laughs> Woo! Say, so, well, he's got a mark against him. Yeah, but he's got a big God. <laughs> oh, one fellow was riding on an ocean liner one day and he looked out over the water and the ocean and he saw the reflection of the sun and he saw the sun shining in that great expanse of ocean and he went up in the mountains of North Carolina sometime later and he found a little mountain spring and he looked down in that little mountain spring and there was that same great sun and then he got up early the next morning and there was a dew, a little drop of dew hanging off a blade of grass. And he looked down in that little drop of dew on that blade of grass and guess what? There was the reflection of that same great sun. And it is not the ocean, and it's not the spring, and it's not the dew. It's the sun that, did, that is important. And I thought to myself, you say, preacher, I haven't been all I'm supposed to be. Then come back and tell God I want to be what you want me to be and see of God. You might be like an ocean. You might be like a mountain spring. You might be just a little dew drop. But that same great Son of God can be a reflection in your life. Who can tell what God can do? Who could tell what God can do with a backslidden saint? But now, wait a minute. When I look in the story of Jonah, I say to myself, who can tell what God can do with a believing servant? Now, I'm going to tell you the truth. Jonah leaves a lot of questions in my mind. As a matter of fact, Jonah is one of only two books in the Old Testament that end with a question. 
And there's a lot of things about Jonah's life that just leave me a little question in my mind. But he went to Nineveh because God told him to when he got right. He believed God. It took a trip in the belly of the fish to convince him, but he did believe God. And he got out of that fish. It vomited him up on the dry land, and he headed into Nineveh, and he began to preach because God called him the second time. And when he preached, the whole city repented from the greatest to the least. I've been preaching about 26 years, 27 years. I've never seen a whole city repent. I've never seen a whole church repent. I don't know. Maybe I have, but I'm not sure. I might have seen a whole family repent. I don't know. I've seen some individuals repent. But here's a man who was a man who didn't want to do what God told him to do. And he didn't have a message of love. It was a message of judgment. And it didn't have an introduction and three points and a poem at the end. It had one point, And he really didn't want to deliver the message. And he really didn't care nothing about the people he was preaching to. But he preached anyway because God told him to. And one of the greatest revivals we ever read about takes place. And a whole city repented from the greatest to the least of them. Who can tell what God can do with a believing servant? say, well, I'll tell you, preacher, sometimes I don't feel like serving. Neither did Jonah. Are you listening now? Sometimes things go on in my life. Things were going on in Jonah's life. But he believed what God said. Hey, look at me. It's a great indictment against us tonight that a whole city repented at the preaching of the man who really didn't want them to get right, who did not love them, and who only preached them one message, and they repented. And here we are that sit in our churches Sunday after Sunday and Wednesday after Wednesday with a preacher that loves us and gets on his knees and prays for us and calls on God and wants to see us get right and wants to see us deliver. And we sit like a bump on a log in a pew and look at him and get angry when he tries. It's a great indictment against the church today when we don't have revival. I'm going to tell you, they had one prophet who didn't care about them. They had one prophet who didn't love them. As far as I can tell, he never prayed for him. I don't know what kind of pathos was in his voice, but I know this. I believe he had just as soon had them destroyed. It grieved him when God did not destroy them in chapter 4. And yet when he preached, they believed God. It's an indictment against the church. But hallelujah, it's an encouragement to the man of God. You say, preacher, i got some hurdles in my service. Jonah had some too. But if you'll just take God at His Word and do what He tells you to do, go where He sends you, say what He says to say, there ain't no telling what God can do. Who can tell? I heard a story about a man driving down the road, a preacher, and there's a pouring down rain. And as he drove down the road, he saw a man walking. The man had on a shirt and a tie and breeches and had his coat kind of wrapped over him and he's walking in the rain. And the preacher thought, well, I better help him. And he stopped and said, sir, can I give you a ride? He said, yes, I'd love a ride. He got in and they start down the road and that man he picked up looked over at the preacher and said, are you born again? He said, I am. I'm a preacher. He said, well, so am I. He said, really? He said, what were you out doing walking in the rain? He said, I just got done preaching. Revival meeting. And my car broke down and I'm walking home. He said, well, how'd it go? He said, I preached tonight on Nicodemus. He said, you thought not calling us. He said, yes, sir, out of John chapter 3. I preached tonight on Nicodemus. He said, you mean Nicodemus? He said, Nicodemus, John chapter 3. He said, how'd the service go? 17 saved. say, well, he didn't exactly say that right. No, but he wasn't the one talking to their hearts. Say, well, he don't pronounce his words exactly right. No, but the Holy Ghost has never had any trouble with English. 
Say, so, well, he's not too polished in his preaching. No, but the Holy Ghost been at this a good long while. You say, well, he's not too educated, not too learned. No, but the Holy Ghost is God and always has been God and always will be God. And he understands and he knows the heart. You say, preacher, I'm going to tell you, I sure would like to serve God. I'd like to just surrender, but I just don't know what I can do. That's your problem, friend. It ain't what you can do. It's what he can do. It ain't how good you are. It's how wonderful he is. There ain't no telling what God will do with a servant who will just believe Him. God came to Moses and said, I, wanna, I want you to go down. I've come down to deliver my people Israel. I'm going to send you down. Moses said, Who am I? Who am I? Who am I that I should deliver Israel? God said, Don't matter who you are, I am. It's not who you are, it's I am. I am. He said, you get down there and tell them I am that I am. Tell them I am. I've sent you unto them. You say, preacher, who am I to preach? It don't matter who you are. It matters who he is. It don't matter what you can do. It's what he can do. It's not your ability. It's the power of God. I got this, I got this thought in my mind. I probably got too much imagination. But I got this thought of Moses headed in to put his finger in Pharaoh's face and say, Let my people Israel go, God said, or I'm going to smite your firstborn. He raised in Egypt. He knows the power of Pharaoh. He knows Pharaoh has with a word power of life and death over him. I see him walking in, going in that palace, passing those pillars. And them soldiers going down that hallway, maybe guards on each side. He comes down and stands and waits his turn as they're fixing to announce his name before Pharaoh. Pretty soon he's walking in and there's the bodyguards on each side of him. And he's walking up to the throne. And there sits Pharaoh high up on the throne, lifted up. And I can hear Moses say as he's walking along, I'm not able to do this. I'm not able to do this. I am not able to do this. And ringing in his ears is that name. I am. I am. I am. I am. I see him leading them people out of Israel. And they're saying they're wondering, weren't there enough graves in Egypt that you brought us out here in the wilderness to die? We want some water. I see Moses saying, I am not able to lead this crowd. I'm not able. But I hear ringing in his ears that name. I am. I am. I am. I'm telling you, friend, it's that faith that pleaseth God. And that's the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. I'm saying you just believe God. Hey, young man, God's dealing with your heart about preaching. You're I don't know if I can. No, it's not whether you can. It's whether He can. And I say to you, He can, friend. He's able. Just let Him have your life. What could God do with somebody like me? Who can tell? Who can tell what God could do? Woo! With somebody like you. Who can tell what God could do with a believing servant? Hey, dear preacher, you're facing the trial. So I don't know if we'll get through this. But who can tell what God would do if you just believe Him? Just take Him at His word. Who can tell? Here's a third thing. I look at this passage and I look at the life of Jonah. I say, who can tell what God can do with a backslidden uh, saint? Who can tell what God can do with a believing servant? But who can tell what God can do with a burdened sinner? Here's a king seated on the throne, known for his violence. Here comes a little old prophet. Into the city a day's journey preaching. Yet forty days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. I don't read where he ever made it into the king's presence. But there's a searching quality about that Word of God. 
you know, if we'd have been a mission board, and I'm not against mission boards, but if they'd have had one there, they'd have said, now, if we're going to send somebody down to Nineveh, we're going to have to figure out what the population is, and we're going to figure out how many missionaries we need, and we're going to divide this thing up into sections and make sure every section gets covered. But there weren't no mission board to help Jonah. All he had was the call of God. He just went in there and started preaching. And the Word of God set up its own program there. And that same Word, the Bible said he went and preached the Word of the Lord. And the same Word is used when it said Word came unto the King. And that King's up there sitting on his throne and Word comes to him that there's about to be an overthrowing, that God is bringing judgment. And here is a King who's had life, the power of life and death over people. And what does he do? He gets up off his throne. He lays aside that royal robe, the symbol of his authority. And he puts on sackcloth. I always wonder about that sackcloth stuff and what it is. So I got to looking it up one day and it said burial clothes. It has to do with burial clothes. And so he got up off his throne. I'm talking about the king of one of the most wicked cities that ever lived. Maybe a wicked nation. He got up, took off his throne, put on sackcloth and sat down in the ashes and said, we got to get right. We got to proclaim a fast. You say, was he serious? I reckon he's pretty serious. He wouldn't even let the cattle eat. He said, we're not just going to do the people. We're going to put sackcloth on the cattle and we're going to proclaim a fast even among the herds. What was he saying? He's saying, we're going to get right with God. Who can tell? I like to picture it. He's sitting down there in the ashes and his nobles are standing around him. They're always the ones that give him counsel. He said, have you heard? They said, we've heard. He said, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? One of them might say, I've heard of this God. I've heard of how the plagues that He brought upon Egypt. He's a God of judgment. We're through. There's nothing we can do. Another one stepped forward and said, I've heard of this God. I heard how he dried up the water of the Red Sea. I heard about what he did in the city of Jericho. I've heard of him. We're done for and no hope. Maybe another one stepped up and said, You're right, he's a holy God. He's a God of judgment. And I've heard that he's done great things. But I've also heard that he's a God of great kindness and a God of great mercy. And maybe if we just repent and get our hearts right, turn from our sin, who can tell what this great God of mercy might do for us? And so the king said, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to proclaim a fast and we're going to tell everybody to mean business with God and we're going to turn from the violence that is in our hands. We're going to turn from our sin and our wickedness. And who can tell if God... And you know what happened? Exactly what I... I what the, that just explains and reiterates and reinforces the nature of God. Uh, the Bible said when He saw uh, their works that they turned from their evil way, He repented of the evil. You know what? You know what? Nineveh really did get overthrown. Their sin got overthrown. Their wickedness got overthrown. Their rebellion got overthrown. God really did overthrow them. But He didn't overthrow them with judgment. He overthrew them with mercy and overthrew them with grace. Hallelujah. See, you're here lost tonight. You're lost without God, without hope in this world. You say, I'm too big a sinner. Hey, friend, I know where there's a big God. He sitteth upon the circle of the earth. He filleth up the heavens. He spreadeth the heavens like a tent. I know where there's a big God. Who can tell? Who can tell? If you just kneel at His feet. One day there was a king named Ben-Hadad. Old Ben-Hadad fought the children of Israel and lost. He got whooped. He took his kings and hid in a house. And he said, what are we going to do? They're going to kill us. And one of them generals stepped forward and said, I've heard that the kings of Israel are merciful kings. He said, let's do this. He said, let's put on sackcloth. And he said, let's put ropes on our heads and go to the kings of Israel. You know what he's saying? He said, let's do this. Let's just take a rope. Put it around our neck and take the other end in our hand and go to the king of Israel and hand him the rope 
and tell him where your servants do with us what you will and see if they'll not have mercy. Oh, dear friend, why don't you do it tonight? Why don't you do it? You say, preacher, I, I see what my sin has done. I see the mess I'm in. Then why don't you just put a rope around your heart and come to the Lord and hand him the other end and say, here you are, Lord. I repent. Can I have some mercy? You say, well, we do. Who can tell? I got a pretty good idea what he'll do. I got a pretty good idea he'll fall on your neck and kiss you like he did the prodigal son in that passage. I got a pretty good idea that he'll save you if you come to him. But preacher, how can a holy God, how can He save a sinner? How can He love someone that sinned? I'll tell you why. Because when I read when I read Jonah chapter 3, I see a picture I just can't get away from and I can't get over. I see a king who was sitting on a throne and he heard about a sin problem. And because of the sin problem, he got up off the throne and he took off his robe and he put on death clothes and sat down in ashes. I'm not talking about the king of Nineveh. I'm talking about another king who sat on the throne of glory named Jesus Christ, King of kings and Lord of lords. And there was a sin problem, not His own, but yours and mine. So He got up off the throne in heaven and laid aside His royalty and put on death clothes and sat down among the ashes so that you and I could come and get born again and know the forgiveness of God. Who can tell? I believe that's what Paul was talking about when he said, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of man, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name, which is above every name, at the name of Jesus. Every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. There was a king who saw your need and laid aside. His royal robe. He didn't cease to be God. But He put on the death clothes. And you and I are dust and ashes. And He sat down among us and died. Why? So that I could stand in this pulpit tonight and say to sinners, Who can tell? So I could stand in this pulpit tonight and say to backslidden saints, Who can tell? So I could... Hallelujah! So I could stand in this pulpit tonight and say to discouraged but believing servants, Who can tell what God will do if you just come to Him? Who can tell? Who can tell? Who can tell? Who can tell tonight? Hey, Mom and Daddy, don't give up. Who can tell? Hey, backslider, don't run away. Who can tell? Hey, servant of God, don't quit. Who can tell? Hey, sinner, don't run from the cross. Who can tell? Who can tell? Who can tell tonight what God could do if we just ask Him? Who can tell? I want you to bow your heads if you would, please. Your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed. Who can tell?